All right. How's everybody doing today? Good. Are you pumped to be here? I mean, seriously, put it together. Uh, I am excited. I could barely sleep last night. Uh, I have been looking forward to this conference for like five months now. And uh, I'm really excited to meet all of you and uh, just to hand out a ton of high fives. Uh, I'm a big hugger, too. So if you're a hugger, let's do this thing. Uh, so today we're going to talk about inline styles, and uh, more importantly, we're going to talk about styles in JavaScript versus CSS. So um, as Vijou was saying, uh, in November he kind of introduced this concept um, in his talk CSS and JS, and um, how this was improving their development story, and kind of how it would eventually find its way into iOS and the way that they um, the way that they made that uh, styles work in that platform. And uh, this, this idea just erupted. And so here's a little stat. Um, he was talking about how people responded to his talk. Um, his talk has over 400,000 views. That's insane. I think 1,000 of them at least are me, so. Um, but it's crazy, like over the, fa the past um, four months, there's been a huge surge of libraries and interest in this topic and people talking about it and developing around it. Um, there's a lot of momentum happening here. Um, so five months ago when I proposed this, it was kind of just like one weird trick for styling your React components, um, but it's actually become a thing. So I'm excited to talk to you about that today. Now, as you, oh, sorry, as you may know, um, Pretty much everything in React is initially met with a lot of like fear and screaming, and this idea of inline styles um, was no different. Uh, it got a lot of pushback, um, the same way that JSX has, and it continues to. Um, even just this last uh, this last week at CSS Conf, um, there's a lot of tweets about how this was a terrible idea. This was never going to work. All us JavaScript people were absolutely crazy and out of our minds. Um, and I saw this a lot. It's time to truly learn CSS. This is what all the CSS people are kind of pointing their fingers and wagging at us. And I think that this is total bullshit. Seriously. <laughs> um, I think this is a sentiment that is designed to sell books, but it's not true anymore. Um, if if CSS, if learning CSS is one of the required hurdles to shipping an app, like that's a huge hurdle. And I think that um, it's truly, there's never been a better time not to learn CSS. And React has really enabled us um, to have a path to make great products without having to learn about the cascade and inheritance and all this crazy stuff like browser inconsistencies. Like you just don't need to know that stuff. Um, Jeremy Ashkenes, the uh, creator of CoffeeScript and Backbone, um, said this in a talk recently. He says um, uh, about HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. He says, someone is going to unify these three different syntaxes and write a language that just addresses the web platform directly, and it's going to be insanely popular. And I think that that's what we're seeing in React. I think that we have a, um, we have a language and a platform that allows us to just address the web, um, and now iOS, um, with these singular ideas of components. And it's incredibly powerful, and you're seeing the community just burst at the seams around the power of React. Um, and the cool thing is that this uh, reduces the difference uh, <laughs> sorry, uh, reduces the distance between knowledge and capability. So it's easier to do the things that you want to do without having to learn things that are kind of um, inconsequential. Unfortunately, the conversation around this still sucks. Um, we have people just talking at two different levels. Um, like I said, uh, des designers, I'm a designer, so I definitely can empathize with that, that sentiment. Like, I've got 10 years of experience in this thing. I don't want to see it go away. Um, and then JavaScript, people are like, oh, I just want to put everything in JavaScript, databases in JavaScript, like CSS in JavaScript, like just put, put everything in there. Um, so today we're going to talk a little bit about suitability and capability. So my talk is mostly going to be focused on where we kind of find, um, find a boundary for you and your teams to talk about inline styles. Because it might not be all the way and it may not be nothing. Uh, it could be something in the middle. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk a little bit about that. And the capability, um, what we're able to do to emulate some of the um, features that we have in CSS. 
So I want you to think about this talk like a metro, metro train, okay? We're starting here, and we're gonna go all the way to Crazy Town, but I'm gonna make some stops along the way so you can get off wherever it makes sense for you and your team. Uh, so the first thing is, um, I, I have a couple themes. So the first is style is not CSS. The second is that state changes are UI changes. And components should be reused, not repurposed. So I'll talk about those a little bit. Um, style is not CSS. This is kind of like a square rectangle type of relationship. So CSS is styles, but styles is not CSS. You can define styles in HTML, JavaScript, CSS. It really doesn't matter. Um, and the fact that we kind of refer to these as the same thing, styles and CSS being the same thing, um, it makes the conversation very hard. So one of the first things is just stop calling them CSS. Um, try to correct people. And it'll make the conversation a lot easier. Uh, changes, um, state changes are UI changes. Now, I have an asterisk here because this might not be true all the time, but the more interactive our web apps and websites and components get, um, the more true this gets. It's, it's very rare that you're going to have, um, you're gonna take some input and not give any input back to the user. So there's, there's this kind of give and take, there's this like closing of the loop. You know, if they do something, it succeeds, you tell them. If it fails, you tell them. There's a loop here. And the last thing is that components should be reused, not repurposed. Um, this is an argument that I hear a lot on the CSS side, is like, oh, well, we you know, have all these styles we wanna you know, reuse. And the thing is, we're reusing components, but what they're talking about is repurposing the CSS, trying to like, have these little pieces that can actually be repurposed for these things that might not have been intended to be repurposed for. And this is kind of part of where we have trouble um, in designing really well-architected CSS. So my thing is I'd rather have like a thousand components than have 200 components that do two things. So let's talk a little bit of history. In the beginning, uh, styling was very easy. You could just put these things right in line. So we have an H1 here and it's color blue. That's very easy to reason about. You don't need a computer science degree to figure out what's happening there. Um, but styles grow and they duplicate. So we got CSS, which allowed us to make a selection and style that selection, and then that would be consistently styled wherever. And this is incredibly popular with the semantic web folks. This is what allowed us to push um, standards forward very well. Um, it's totally important and the basis for a lot of what we have been able to accomplish since. And so we had this idea of semantics, and you'd have all your semantic elements, and if you needed more, you would just namespace them and say, hey, now I have two sets, and then this section of the page is gonna be a different set. Like, it's magical. And when, this, when you just had static pages, this was awesome. Like, this was kind of like, you know, faux modules, and this was really all you needed. This was pretty great. But we started to, um, started to discover, you know, Ajax and, and making web applications. So um, anyway, at this point, our separation of concerns grew. We had HTML and then we pulled out CSS, and we called this um, entanglement presentation. So as the web grew and we you know, discovered Ajax, started making applications, um, this became really bad, right? Because now our JavaScript is tangled up with our markup. We can't change our markup without changing the JavaScript. Um, so we needed to define our own semantics. And so we use CSS to do that. We have a to-do list and then items inside of it. And so now we can have markup like this or markup like this, and it really doesn't matter, right? We took that a step further and said, oh, well, anyone can reach in and like style item now, so let's just you know, do what we always do with the browser and namespace it. So our concerns grew again from HTML and CSS to HTML, JavaScript, and CSS. And we had our concern of presentation and then um, behavior. Now, the interactive web comes in, and we have this loop that we're kind of talking about, this feedback loop where the user does something, and then you give them feedback back. This is a state, right? So what does state look like with the separation of concerns that we have now? Well, it looks like this. Everything is interested in everything. Uh, it's very difficult to reason about this system, and everything has to be working together in perfect synchrony um, to actually work. 
So the problem is, is that when we grew our capability, uh, we didn't actually like add another concept. Um, so here we need to add state. And this is where React came in and was our you know, benevolent savior and uh, merged these concepts together. So it took you know, the template and merged that into JavaScript and said, hey, we're going to have handle state for you, and we're going to call this an interface. Right? So we have components. They're just these views. They're interface. It's beautiful. And then, but then on the outside, we still have presentation, right? And so we have this little bit of a loop because we, are, we didn't kind of like grow our thinking at all. And so we still have this state that exists between HTML and CSS, or, or sorry, our React components and CSS. And a lot of times we put this in CSS because it's styles, right? You know, styles are CSS. So obviously we have to do this in CSS. Um, so we end up with a lot of classes like this is complete, is connected, is expanded, is collapsed, is open, is closed, right? So let me ask you something. So we built this, you know, we build a React component. It's a to-do list. It's super dumb, right? But it does know when things are, when things are completed. Can any if, so if I forget to style is complete, can anyone tell me which of these items are selected or not, or complete or not? No. The, the lack of styling has broken our behavior. And this is a bad thing. So the first step, the first step on this, or the first stop on this train is I'm going to say, get rid of these classes and do this part in JavaScript. Bring state fully back in, into JavaScript into your React components. Uh, React is already handling state for you, so let it handle the styles as well. So let's see what this looks like. Uh, again, we're going to build the world's dumbest to-do list. Uh, this is what it looks like. And the, the bottom two were the, the done ones, obviously. Okay, so we have uh, two classes. We have a to-do list and a to-do list item. Uh, our render function looks something like this. We're going to map over all of the items and spit them out. And so we have this class. We'll use class names to then say, okay, when the item is complete, we're going to add this additional class to the DOM called is complete, and then that'll style style our CSS. So in our CSS, we have to add this class and put our styles there, right? So if we were to test around this, it would look something like this: uh, when item is complete, it has state class is complete. Like that just sounds dumb, right? Like it doesn't <laughs> a state class. Anyway, um, so let's look at what this looks like with inline styles. We'll create a variable and put those styles in an object. And then just conditionally put those um, styles directly on the rendered component if the item uh, if the item's complete. So the same, same concept as before, except we have the style that, of the completed item in the component, and then that just gets thrown right, uh, right on the DOM when it gets rendered out. So now we can take out that class. And we can take it out of our CSS as well. And then we can take this dumb test and make it a lot more reasonable. So when item is complete, it appears crossed out, or something along those lines. So what we've done here is that we've brought all of our concerns about state back into the React component. So our React component is the only thing that knows about state in our components. And our CSS is really only I'm concerned about appearance, right? So this isn't about presentation as much as appearance. Like, um, what's the color of it? What's the background color? Are the borders radiused or not? So what if you don't like this default styling, right? Like, you know, I, well, I don't really care if it's crossed out. Um, you can actually create your own style at the call site and uh, pass them those props. Like, we have a mechanism for doing that, right? Uh, so let's change this a little bit. So style, um, if we have more things that we're going to merge in, we need to have a more robust way of merging these styles together. Uh, so we'll use object assign. And uh, if the item's complete, we'll merge in our complete styles. But then also, we can merge in um, any props that you might have sent in at the call site. So this is totally flexible. So when you um, use this component, you can use it in any type of way. You can um, just pass in a new object of the way that you want this style. So if we were calling it just kind of by default, you know, to-do list um, with items, 
we can now say, okay, when it's completed, uh, I want it to, you know, I want it to look like this. And so we're going to have our defaults dial plus this italics. Oh, that slide is wrong because it's not going to be italicized. It's going to be gray, but you get the point. So what we did, um, state is now fully owned by the component. And stateful classes are removed from the DOM and CSS. Uh, CSS is now reduced to appearance only. And styles can be overridden at the call site. And any specs that we write are better. And what it cost us is just that we had to write our state in JavaScript, or our classes in JavaScript, our styles in JavaScript. Third tries a charm. OK, so we're going to move a little bit um, into capability. So these are some of the things that we may want to do in JavaScript that were really easy in CSS. How do we do those? So the first thing is variables. Now, this seems kind of funny to me sometimes, because people ask, well, how do I do variables? I have SAS variables, you know, whatever. And it's funny, because SAS variables are fake, and like JavaScript has actual variables. So I don't know. So anyway, this is what uh, SAS, vari SAS variables might look like in your SAS file. And you can just put these in a module here, right? So we'll export that out. And then we can import all of our app colors. Or if we want, we can just import orange and indigo. If we want to theme our component, uh, we can have two sets of colors. We can have a dark module and a light module. Import that in. And then just kind of change the colors based on a prop that we have on our component. Super easy. Uh, pseudo classes. Uh, so pseudo classes are these fake classes that allow you to select something based on um, an element's relationship to something else in the do document, right? So here, this is where we left off our uh, to-do list. And so if we want, we can um, add, you know, tiger striping, you know, every other line um, just by doing this. So, you know, we'll say I modulus two and say if that's true, we're going to say the background color is, you know, pound F2, 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 right? Uh, if we have any, you know, concerns about length, uh, we can take length uh, array off a of map and then um, use this in our equation. And again, we can use um, a variable here. So these are kind of a handful of the pseudo classes that we tend to use a lot. And these are the ways that you would do them using map and, uh, and math. All right, pseudo elements. So pseudo elements are fake elements that allow you to keep semantics while jamming in other elements um, via CSS. Uh, so they're written in CSS like this. You have my class, and you have like before and after. And you can add content um, dynamically to, um, to the DOM through these CSS classes. So if this is what you wrote your HTML like, um, then before and after kind of get shoved in before and after your content. Um, so in React, these are just elements, right? Like we're not totally worried about you know, semantics because we're writing components. We're kind of defining our own semantics. So when you're writing uh, React components, you just use regular elements. That simple. Um, now, if you have worked in this, um, you know that these are the easy problems, and there are a set of hard problems that I haven't talked about yet. Fortunately, over the past four months, with the introduction of all of these like, great libraries and thought around these ideas, um, this has become much easier. Um, in fact, it's made this talk a lot easier. Um, I was, uh, the majority of this talk was set up to telling you how to do all these complicated things. And the truth is, is that they're being done already and make your life a lot easier and your team's lives a lot easier. Team's life or team's lives? Anyway, um, so this is how Hover looks in CSS, right? It's delightfully simple. Like, that's amazing. That's a great API. This is what it looks like in a React component. Not quite so simple, right? Um, and so this gets worse if we wanted to add media queries to this. So we had just like a simple media query. Like this is really, really, really simple. And like this is what our React component looks like. Like if I told you that this was part of inline styles, you would just totally disregard me at this point. Um, so this isn't better, right? 
Um, but in some cases it is. Um, as we continue to, as the browser continues to progress and we have different types of inputs, Hover actually gets increasingly sloppy. I'm sure that not, many of you have noticed this um, on a site that has, you know, kind of a hover on a link. You know, you have to tap that link twice to actually go to the link, right? You know, the first tap will kind of bring up the hover state and then you have to go to the link. And that's incredibly confusing. And a lot of times we end up solving this with JavaScript anyway. So having, having this level of control is incredibly powerful when you need it. But it's also nice to have some sensible defaults that are easier to kind of just kind of get going and make your application, right? Uh, so this is where some of the libraries come in. My favorite right now is Radium. Uh, I'm going to talk about Radium a little bit, um, but there are a number of libraries that solve the same problem in a similar way. So I'll, I'll tell you where to find information about that in a little bit, too. Um, so how does, um, how does this look in Radium? So we have our hover again, delightfully simple. And this is what it looks like um, as a JavaScript variable. Again, delightfully simple. That was easy, right? Uh, so let's add media queries. This is going to suck, right? Uh, so we have a media query. And again, wow, that's surprisingly, that's surprisingly simple. It's lovely. So how this works, um, it actually is pretty great. Um, so this, say this is your React component. Uh, you can just, if you're using ES7 uh, with Babel, you can um, just use a decorator and decorate this with Radium. With CommonJS, you would use their enhancer. And then with a little bit of trickery, you can do this in ES5 with globals. So if you're you know, still on that, on that road, good for you. You're fighting a good fight. <laughs> You'll get there eventually. So let's look at this. So um, on the left there, we have um, JavaScript, JavaScript with Radium. And on the right, we have um, SAS. And SAS is kind of like the de facto, right? Like all of, the all of my fellow designers at work, they love SAS, right? So I can actually pitch this. This is a huge win for teams that have like an existing code base and something like SAS or less or what have you. Um, now, like I said, there are a huge number of other libraries that do a similar thing slightly differently or completely differently. Um, some of them require a build step. Some of them use kind of language extensions to actually write like CSS. Um, they have different ways of overriding default styles. Um, so I recommend that you look at them. Um, Radium has a great comparison chart that's um, been pretty regularly updated on their GitHub repo. So. Um, all you need to know is Radium, go there, find the comparison chart. It's very easy to find. And um, you can find something that is a perfect fit um, for your application and your team. Um, one of the reasons that I like Radium is because it's all, it all happens runtime. And for us, we have six Rails apps. Um, so having the additional build step isn't quite an option if we want to keep, um, keep our Rails parity between those apps. All right, so I got a little bit of a grab bag here for you. These are kind of just some random things that we found helpful. Uh, SAS has these really great color functions that allow you to take um, color values and manipulate them kind of relatively, right? Um, there's a great library on NPM called Color. Um, it's by H. Arthur Color. Um, and what this does is it allows you, so we'll import color and we'll import orange and indigo, and then we can and then use color to lighten indigo by 2%, right? This is really awesome, and it happens you know, all dynamically at runtime. Uh, layout. So you can use any layout library you want. Um, we still use um, something that's kind of you know, foundation-based. If, really, if your team's really comfortable with Bootstrap or one of the micro libraries out there, use it. Like, that is like the perfect use case for CSS. Like these things are actually designed to be totally reusable. You're not ever redefining these things. Uh, that is a great place to use them. Uh, one thing is you may be inclined to um, put the classes directly on your component. Don't do that. Um, oh, you, uh, you should wrap, them, wrap your components in like another div with those classes. And uh, we found uh, a lot of times it tends to be helpful to um, make our components to be comfortable in like any environment. So you know, just kind of be like 100% width and height of whatever the containing element is. And if it's you know a very tailored component, we'll make you know another component that kind of wraps that in a very specific way. 
Uh, distributed components, we're gonna touch this. This could be a whole talk all on its own. Um, so one thing is don't get trapped in the idea that you can only export one component. Right, so the media object um, is, you know, has a lot of options, and like trying to pass styles in for each of the elements that might get used um, could be a huge pain. Um, so I'd recommend exporting, you know, kind of all of those pieces, and then allowing the developer to use those, and then uh, apply styles as they need to each item. Uh, a great example of this, if you want to learn more about um, this this concept is um, the React sound player. Um, this is a beautifully written component. If you haven't seen it, this is an incredible model for how to develop um, complex distributed components. So I recommend checking that out. It's really great. So this is our last stop on the inline styles train. I think that components are the cornerstone of interactive experience, interactive experiences on the web and mobile. And they, they're just so incredibly expressive, right? And so my moment on the inline styles journey came when I was, I was creating this, scaffolding out this component, and it was like the 50th one I'd done, right? So I you know, just kind of put the, the markup in there, and then I added my classes, and then I created another style sheet that has all those classes in there. And I just got started thinking, like, what the hell? Like, I have the component file name, my component class definition. I'm using, um, you know, five class names in there. And then the, you know, style sheet file name. And then all of those same classes are in there, too. This coupling was just, like, driving me crazy. And every time we decided that, like, oh, this component actually should be named something else, or we were going to change the relationship between, like, the ch parent and the child, like, all these classes had to be kind of rejiggered, right, in all of the places that they were being used. They're literally being held together by a string. It's stupid. So there's this um, really amazing, one of my favorite developers, Sandy Metz, um, in the Ruby world. It says, the purpose of design is to allow, allow you to do design later. And its primary goal is to reduce the cost of change. So if we're developing like this, we have, our cost of change is really high. And our design is all up front. And this is a really, like, this is really bad. Like, because change sucks. That's not the fun part. That's not the fun part of your job. You don't like doing that part. And you're not going to do it if it's too difficult. So we made the jump, and we took our appearance into, into our components. Um, this has been incredibly wonderful for us. Um, like I said, this is a journey, so we're continuing to kind of learn exactly how exactly how that works um, across across our applications. Um, but it's it's something worth chasing. And I think that when you do this, you can fully live inside the promise of React. Uh, these component the components become the boundaries of your separations of concerns. So closing thought, um, I turned 32 this year, and the thing that I've learned about in my 30s is that I can't eat everything and do nothing at the same time. Um, so I bought a bike, and I've really been enjoying that. Um, now, my bike has components that are designed for a bike, right? So like, if I get a flat on my car, I can't like just put two of my bike tires together and then repurpose those to like be a car tire, right? Um, but I can switch out those components with other bike components. Um, the components were designed for a bike, right? Um, also, the appearance of my bike doesn't affect um, the way that it behaves, right? Uh, it, my bike would be useless if it doesn't have like a frame and tires and handlebars, right? But paint doesn't matter at all. A bike has components designed and that are complete to serve the purpose of the whole bike, right? Inline styles get us closer to directly addressing the web and iOS by separating concerns of the boundaries of components, not technologies. So as we close up, uh, style is not CSS. State changes are UI changes. Components should be reused, not repurposed. And it's a great time to get involved. Um, if this stuff interests you, um, I really ask that you pick a project and kind of like get into it. Um, 
there are still a lot of questions around how these perform and like kind of the best way to actually um, build teams around these, you know, because we've separated kind of a designer and developer for a really long time. Um, so get involved. Um, we, we really need help kind of figuring out the rest of this. Uh, so I'm Jim Ta Chantastic on Twitter, and uh, I have some stickers if, if you want. I set them in uh, Comic Sans to be totally inflammatory. So thank you so much.